Good afternoon and welcome to this week's Facebook Live event. Today, we'll be discussing the impact of the pandemic on the arts industry in Wales. Our theatres are closed and our dance floors are empty. So we'll be asking how this sector hopes to rebuild itself as we look to the future. I'm Jacob Morris and joining me live in our newsroom is our correspondent, Kat Keithley, who will be keeping an eye on what you have to say at home. Pranam da, Kat. Good afternoon, Jacob. Yes, I'll be taking your comments live on the Facebook page. See what you have to see, what you have to say, and see what you think, and so we can answer your questions. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. So please like, react, and comment below, and use the hashtag. The show must go on. We'd love to hear from you. Back to you, Jacob. Thank you, Kat. Well, yes, our all-female panel are looking forward to take part. They are taking centre stage today. Joining us is the Shadow Cabinet Minister for Culture, the Welsh Language and Education, Shan Gwenllian. Also joining us is Sarah Hemsley-Cole. She's the head of We Make Events Cymru, and she's the director of SC Production. She's organised large-scale events for people like Ed Sheeran and the Stereophonics. And finally, the West End star, Sophie Evans. From the Rhondda to the West End, she's performed on various stages world worldwide. She, uh, of course, has been Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz and Glinda in Wicked, but she's here with us today on CJS News. Croeso Maur to you all on the panel. So, without further ado, the show must go on. So, firstly, I'd like to come to you, Sarah Hemsley-Cole. We've heard yesterday that the Green Man Festival are planning to go ahead. The Green Man Festival, of course, is the largest festival, one of the largest festivals in Wales. How do you feel about this? Well, obviously, it's really exciting to get the sector moving, to get people back to work, to get creative energy back into our lives. You know, so ultimately, I'm really excited. There's been lots of announcements about other festivals outside of the uh, of Wales as well. So it's a really positive step. I think we've still got a long way to go. Um, it's still difficult, you know, the Welsh Government haven't said that large scale events can happen. So I think there's still uh, a journey uh, to, to take. And we are also um, with Welsh Government looking at some test events as soon as the tier status changes here in Wales, so that we can start to really create that rigour and that um, the, the systems that we need to have in place to facilitate events over the summer. And, and from a commercial point of view, it's still a gamble. There's no certainty that even the large scale events that are out there at the moment will be able to happen. Uh, we don't really know, as we have seen over the last few months, what our destiny is during COVID. It, it takes us on some journeys that perhaps, you know, uh, cause some complications. So, you know, brilliantly positive news, you know, but uh, with caution uh, to see how it actually can pan out in reality. Uh, thank you there, Sarah. Now, I'd like to bring you in, Sophie. Of course, you work in the industry. Your work has completely dried up over this last year. Tell us a bit how it's been over this period. Yeah, um, I don't want to be like, woe is me, but yes, it's been really difficult. As someone who has all, well, in my career in the last 10 years, I've always wanted to go out into the world and all of my work is outside of my house. Um, so it was a real shock to the system when everything stopped. Um, and I think like a lot of people, I kind of enjoyed the slower pace of life for the first two or three months and thought, okay, great, I can regenerate and then go back out into the world. And it's just been so much longer than I think anyone anticipated that um, the last couple of months have been a real struggle for me. I've done a lot of online things, keep myself active that way, but I still crave that, you know, going out into the world, performing live. Um, and I just can't see how it'll happen anytime soon. I know that you just mentioned there that some festivals will be going ahead, uh, to hopefully this year. I just can't see how we're quite ready for that yet. Um, so, yeah, but, but mainly the biggest, biggest problem has been that I haven't, and again, I don't want to put it on me, but a people like myself, a lot of people like myself, we haven't been seen by the government and I haven't received any help, any funding. It's just retrain, do something else. And that's been the kind of shock as well. Yes, I'm sure it's very difficult for people in, like yourself in the industry. And we'll come on to talking about retraining um, later. But Shan Gwynllian, has the Senev done enough to promote and help people in the arts industry through this difficult time? Well, I think they were really slow. Um, 
government, uh, the Welsh government is really slow at the beginning of the pandemic back in March. Um, and um, I remember that time having lots of conversations with people in the art sector who were uh, very, very anxious about, you know, where they were going to be uh, supported, how they were going, going to be supported. Um, and it, it, it was really frustrating um, to see uh, that there was money going to be available, but that it was really slow in the rollout uh, of getting some of that to the correct places. And, you know, hearing Sophie say that she hasn't had anything, I mean, there were obvious gaps um, in the support that was available. Um, but I think, you know, going forward, um, I think we really need to embed the art sector and the culture sector as part of COVID recovery. And um, to do that properly, the government really has to see the culture and the arts as pivotal in so many aspects of our lives and embed um, the arts across all government departments and in, in the COVID recovery work now that the investment that's going to be needed in, in, in health and education involves the arts sector as well and the cultural mm. sector as well and we you know we've all missed uh, having culture uh, cultural events having the socializing that happen that happens through the arts well okay let's turn that on its head now let's do this you know let's use the opportunities that are presented through the arts as part of our covid recovery Yes, I think we can agree we're all missing uh, the arts at this time. Well, if you're joining us, welcome to a live discussion about the impact of the pandemic on the arts sector in Wales is approaching 2022. Now, Sarah Hemsley-Cole, you run a production company. You've adapted by being heavily involved in the development of the recent Calon of Rye Hospital in the Principality Stadium. Now, how has your industry, in particular the events, had to adapt to this new age? Well, you know, as Sophie said, back in March last year, I don't think any of us anticipated it was going to go on for this long. But initially, uh, you know, we are doers, I think, in our, in, particularly in the production world, we're very much doers. And we needed to do our whole summer season of events had fallen away and we wanted to, to, to fill our time. So we were very fortunate, as you mentioned, we worked on the hospital build at the principality. We were able to supply staff for accreditation and the site office but that meant uh, and that was a 24-hour uh, operation at that point in the early days and I was able to get 16 people into work straight away the so people who'd lost work on um, you know we were about to go off and start building the air as I Stedford up in Denby so my team that would normally do that got work at the hospital on the on the staff that we were putting in and 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 replace work that way so We've had to adapt more recently. I've got a member of staff out building testing centers. You know, we're used to working with porter cabins, generators, marquees. So we're just, you know, where our sector has um, re-diversified uh, some of the hardware, like cabins, marquees, we've gone as well. And and, and Jake site manages uh, those, those projects on behalf of a company called Sunbelt. So throughout the industry, you know, there's another, um, production company in London supporting uh, the, the morgues and, you know, and and all of that and some of it's not very glamorous some of it is a long way from working with someone like Ed Sheeran on a festival site but you know we we wanted a pitch in we're, we're, we're grafters we know how to work hard and I think we all felt a sense of responsibility mm -hmm. to help make and do whatever we could in the pandemic which would in turn lead to us going back to our regular jobs. Uh, yes, I'd like to bring you in here, Sophie. Now, you've mentioned uh, just now that you've had to uh, retrain and adapt. Of course, you've been offered, not retrain, had to adapt. You've had to offer singing lessons, I think you mentioned briefly. But what support do you think that the people who are starting off in their careers uh, need at this current time? We know it's a very competitive industry to be in. Um, surely it's harder than ever for them to kickstart their careers at the present time. Yeah, it's that's the group of people that I've been thinking about the most throughout lockdown, people that have just graduated from drama schools or are thinking about going to drama schools. And now this has happened and the industry has completely collapsed and there aren't any jobs. And, and it's always, as you say, it's such a competitive industry anyway, that I think there's a, a, a statistic that 80% of performers are out of work at one time. So that's massive. So now that it's you know, a much higher percentage and there are people going into the industry with less chance and less opportunities, it, it must be so disheartening. So what I would say to those people is it will get back to normal. And I honestly believe 
when things are allowed to be um, normalized again, it'll boom and it'll explode and everything will be amazing and, and, and people will want to go out and support again. So I just think, you know, hold tight. It's been long. It's hopefully not going to be too much longer. Just hold tight, keep positive and keep yourself active. Keep training, keep doing your online dance classes, online singing lessons and keep, you know, being creative. It is hard, but we will get there. I truly believe that we will. Um, now, Sean and Fian, a lot say that they've in the industry that they've been forgotten about in this pandemic. Have they? Are these claims valid? Well, I think there is a sense um, that uh, they have been marginalised um, and, you know, that is the challenge going forward now, um, is to bring the arts really back into, into the work that needs to happen from, from this point onwards. Um, I've been quite impressed, for example, with what New Zealand have been doing, for example, they've got a COVID recovery plan that involves artistic practitioners of all sorts, all sorts of performers, all sorts of artists, um, all sorts of, of, of um, creative um, practitioners. They, they are involved in the recovery in the schools. Um, they are part and parcel of how the government there is trying to get um, young people and children to express some of the anxiety that they've been through, express some of the feelings that um, that need to come out at this point, you know, and helping with with well being. So there's a there's a crucial role there. And okay, maybe maybe the sector feels that they have been forgotten, um, but you know, I would like to see them central as a central part now of, of what we need to be developing going forward. There's a huge role for the arts to be supporting well-being, community cohesion, economic regeneration. There's so much there that needs to be tied in. Um, and um, I'm hoping that Plaid Cymru will be in government and that you know, a Plaid Cymru government would um, ensure that the arts are central. Um, and just one more point, um, if I may, I think it's important as well to see the arts and the, the whole sector. Um, it's an integrated sector. Each part is dependent on the other. Um, Sophie depends on having a platform to perform upon, um, you know, the, the, the people who run the centres and have stage the events depend on people like Sophie to participate so it's a huge network and that network needs to be supported um, as well as as that network supporting us in our efforts to recover. Uh, now then moving on um, Sarah Hemsley Cole um, Wales was given 3.8 percent of the 1.57 billion pound grant by the UK government as the head of We Make, Event, Make, we Make Events Cymru, you know about the financial impact of those in the industry, but do you think there's enough assistance for the events industry in particular? I mean, I think what the reality is, you know, obviously when that 3% uh, boiled down, it was uh, six, uh, 53 million that was divvied out across uh, arts organizations, museums, individuals, and um, supply chain in Wales, you know, it wasn't it wasn't going to be enough. The Welsh government did top it up, so I think you know, it it patched a hole. It didn't solve a problem. It was a patch, and we are dangerously close to a precipice now, where that money was all up and uh, given on the basis that it was up until the thirty first of March. That is literally weeks away, and there's still no Ooh. indication. There's conversation, but there's no real indication at the moment from Welsh Government what that next package of support is, because we need another package of support. There is no way we are going to get to sustain the performers, the individuals, the buildings. The buildings have been closed for like a year. You know, supply chain, you know, we need that extra support now going forward to be able to even come out the other side of this, because potentially, you know, the, everything hangs on the budget next week. You know, if furlough's not extended, that's obviously helped uh, employers like myself to keep my staff in, in employed. But, you know, all of these things could dangerously be slipping away from us over the next few months. And that leaves us in a really difficult place. 
Um, now, I'd like to bring you in here, Sophie. Um, you've been in leading roles in the West End, but what about those perhaps who are in the chorus line or in other productions across the country, far away perhaps from the bright lights of the West, uh, West End and London? Um, how are they going to survive moving on into the future? Um, I can't really answer for them, I suppose, but just from having friends who work in the ensemble and they are such hard workers and yes the pay people think if you're on the west end you're a millionaire that is not the case whatsoever you work eight shows a week for i don't know how much the exact minimum is but it's a couple of hundred pounds a week and you have to pay to live in london uh, like you mentioned there are people on tours and again travel costs hotel costs or accommodation costs you know you work for a small amount of money if you're in an ensemble because you just love it people do it because they just love it it shouldn't be the case people should be paid a bit a, a good wage because you put your life into being a performer um it's not something you can do on the side it is a lifestyle to be uh, in a show of any kind um so I know a lot of people that have moved home, they've moved back in with family um, and they have retrained. I've seen a lot of people on Facebook say that they've they're training to be a teacher, they're training to be a personal trainer, always <laughs> using their people skills because we are good with, with people usually. Um, I've had people on there say they're gonna go and train to be a pharmacist or something that's completely different as well. So people are having to change. They're having to change what they do. And it's quite sad because it means that those talented people are now not in the industry anymore. And, and it might be years before they can come back in because they just can't financially take the risk um, because it's always a risk to be a performer because you're out of work all the time. Um, so now that the opportunities, as I say, are completely gone, and are people, my, this is how my, my mind works, are people going to take the risk to put on a concert or um, a theatre production throughout the summer and towards Christmas because everything's had to be cancelled, postponed, people have had to have tickets refunded, and it's such a big pressure for producers as well. So, mm. yeah, it's it's just, it's really upsetting. It really is that people are now having to choose a completely different line of work because they have to. I can believe it's a very um, troubling time for you with the industry. But we're now going to go to Kat Keithley, our correspondent, who's live in our newsroom, who's keeping an eye on what you have to say at home, and she'll be putting questions to the panel. Hi, Kat. Hi, Jacob. Yeah, we've had quite a few comments come in. Um, we've had a comment from Candy Beaufort Jones. She's asking, why can't we open the theatres and let people sit socially distanced? Uh, Sarah Hemsley Cole, would this be possible? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely something we're working towards. And it's, uh, it, it is laid out in the, the government alert levels as to the worst government alert level, levels and, uh, when that will be able to happen, which is in tier two. Um, you know, things are going well at the moment and we're hoping we can get there. And I think that still will come, that will, that will come with the caveat of the socially distanced seating. You know, there's uh, work to be done around how we manage in the foyers, if it's one way systems, you know, how the bathrooms and stuff are used, if there's an interval, you know, there's lots of detail to tease out. But the industry, we keep presenting to government that we're innovative, we're creative, we can solve these problems. So. Frustratingly, uh, you know, the, the public health officials feel that it's not appropriate to open the buildings before tier two. Uh, but as soon as they give us that green light, my God, we're going to be opening those doors, polishing down them seats and getting people on them. You know, we can't wait for that moment. So, um, so yeah, unfortunately, we are we are restricted to the, to the, the tier two to allow that to happen. Yeah, but that's very encouraging news, though. Um, for another question or well, comment from Charlie George, uh, he says, as a member of a choir, I've really struggled with our weekly interactions and socialising with friends. What do you think the impacts have been on people who rely so heavily on these clubs for their mental health? Sean Wenxian, what support do you think should be put in place to help people like Charlie who miss that social interaction? Well, you know, there has, as Sarah says, um, the creative sector has been very creative in the way that it has um, been able to offer, um, okay, that socialising isn't able to happen face to face in, 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 in a physically, but there's so much that ha is happening online, um, on Zoom, is that, you know, it's, I've been amazed really to see the innovation that's happened and how people have continued to um, be able to, to gather together to sing. Um, so, you know, yes, it's, it's, it's very difficult 
difficult for people not to actually meet in the same place, but it is possible. So what my advice would be, you know, find a group that is kind of singing online and, and joining in that way for the time being. And then I think, you know, what say, Sophie was saying, I think once that start, things will start getting back again, whoosh, well, I think we are going to see, um, you know, that excitement and that um, energy will really be there in the live um, performances that we're all looking forward to seeing again. Yeah, definitely. I think a lot of people are going to be looking forward to that. Thank you so much, Sean. So back to you, Jacob, in the studio. Yes, I myself, I'm definitely looking forward to go back uh, to choir practice because th this pandemic has revealed how much I think socialising means to us. Now, I'm going to come back to you, Sophie Evans. Um, how has this pandemic perhaps affected your morale and well-being? Um, I've been up and down, I think, like everybody. As I say, the first couple of months, I was eating really healthy. I was one of the people that was like, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this time wisely. And I ate really healthy, I went on long walks, as you know, the one a day walk that we were allowed to do. I was exercising out the garden because we had lovely weather and everything felt kind of positive. It felt like a big breath. It felt like, oh, the world's just taking a breath and that was okay. And then um, we obviously were allowed out a little bit and that was lovely. And I did, you know, go for some meals and that kind of gave us a little bit of hope. But from, um, when was it? I can't remember exactly, October time or whenever it was, November, when we had this new lockdown and it got dark and cold and wet again I I did find it very very difficult to, to keep positive I've had I couldn't tell you how much work I've had cancelled this year um lucky to be even even have the work there in the first place but so much was cancelled it was always doom and gloom at Christmas I was meant to have these amazing socially distanced everything was put in place concerts in London um that everyone was so excited about. We did all the promo for it. And then the week before it was pulled. And it's, it's just, it was just so disheartening to think, you know, not only the performers were let down, the product, everyone's job was taken away and the audience members now had nothing to look forward to. Um, so that affected me quite a lot. I just felt, you know, the pressure was, was too much. And there's only so much you can do online. Yeah, online, online stuff has been amazing. But it's got to the point now where I feel guilty to ask people to buy my live stream concert or, you know, do you want to sing in lesson? Give me your money to sit, sit at home and I teach you, you know, it, it all it's getting a bit too much. Like I feel a bit guilty about everything, but obviously I'm just trying to make a living. I'm trying to keep going. I'm trying to keep myself in the public eye so people don't forget about you because people, you know, if you don't put your stuff out there on social media, you'll, you'll just be forgotten about. So it's been up and down, but mainly positive. Um, but there have been very dark days as well. I'm not, I won't lie about that. I think it'd be very difficult to forget about you, uh, Sophie Evans. <laughs> but um, I'm going to come to uh, Sarah Cole next. Now, I'm sure we are all uh, waiting to be back in that crowded field with people in a festival. Um, when we're finally out of this very dark tunnel then, Sarah Cole, um, how prepared is the industry for this new age post-COVID? The industry has been working really hard in the background. Uh, what's been really amazing, actually, uh, we all know who each other are. There's lots of people that are competitors, but COVID has really galvanized uh, and, and created a new neutrality in the industry. And everybody, you know, arch rivals have come together to find ways forward. In Wales, we've got a really great team of people who meet regularly with Welsh government from all, you know, grassroots music venues, theatres, festivals, promoters, um, you know, big event operators, you know, we all come together with Welsh Government officials to have regular conversation. The same thing happens in uh, all of the, the nations across the UK. Um, you know, there's various um, documents have been put together, some by the Arts Council of Wales, some by Welsh Government, some come straight from DCMS. There's new festival guidance coming out uh, very shortly, that paper is written with DCMS. You know, we can't solve everything, but we're a pragmatic um, a group of people. We always have solutions. The event industry is very heavily regulated in, in many ways, much, um, much tighter than lots of other things that happen. So there's always a huge amount of planning that goes into a festival. It takes months and months to plan. And that includes, you know, uh, liaison with police, local authorities, environmental health officers. You know, we, you know, we're building small villages every time we have a festival, you know, transport networks, all sorts of things. So 
So as an industry, there's been an amazing amount of dialogue, amazing amount of hard work, some real innovation in terms of what's practicable. Uh, you know, ultimately, when people come together in large numbers, they want to be in big crowds and in large numbers. And, you know, they want to be in mosh pits and they want to be jumping around and they want to get off their head on, you know, booze or whatever. Do you know what I mean? That's part of the experience. So there are challenges in how we can facilitate that in a sort of post-COVID world, but we're never going to give up. We're never going to stop trying to make that happen. Um, yes, I think we're going to move to Kat back in the uh, newsroom there, because I think we're getting quite a bit of reaction online. Um, Kat, what's the latest? Yeah, we've had loads of reaction. Uh, we've got a question from Sean William Jones. Uh, he's saying, as a recent graduate and finishing my degree online during lockdown and hearing that we should retrain and find other jobs, this is really disheartening and gutting. Um, what are the panel's views on the statement by Rishi, Rishi Sunak? Uh, Sophie, do you share the same view as Sean? Uh, is, it, is it disheartening to hear that um, you might have to retrain or other people that you know might have to retrain after years of intense musical theatre training? Yes, it is. It's really disheartening because not only have they worked extremely hard, it's so expensive to train at drama schools in London, especially and well, all over the country. You know, you especially if you haven't had uh, any help, you know, you can have kind of um, sponsorship and things for schools. But if you haven't, you're left with quite a bit of money there, you know, that you, you're in debt with. So the fact to now think, oh, I need to retrain again and spend more money when I, I haven't opportunity to earn any money is so disheartening. And I think well, the, what people like Rishi Sunak um, don't quite understand about creatives in general is we are diverse and people who are performers are out of work so much that they do have other skills they work in restaurants they work in pubs they work in shops they work in schools they do lots of things but all of these jobs have been taken away from them we're self-employed so it's not like we can just be furloughed from a company that we've worked for in the past um so to say retrain is just so insensitive because people have other skills they're not only trained in singing performing and acting or wig wig making or you know uh, working backstage being stage management or anything they always have something else that they can do so to say retrain is so insensitive in my opinion so yeah can I yeah. just come in there and just endorse that completely? I think that was a completely wrong message um, to be uh, giving out from, from government. Um, and in fact, it should be the opposite should be, be they should be saying, you know, that they should see the skills that you have as mm. a crucial to the way that we need to move forward now out of uh, out of this the crisis that we've all been through together the skills that are available in the creative sector are, are, those are the skills that we need um and i think it you know it's oh, I, I, well it must say it it says everything to me um about the way that the tories think about the arts the kind of reaction that we've had um, from the Westminster government um, and I hope you know in Wales we do really regard the arts as a vital part of all our lives and um, I think the pandemic's actually shown us that it's, sh it's shone a light on how important the arts are um, and uh, the collaboration that's happening within the sector has been fantastic as well Sarah as you say um, I think the um, I've joined the um, what's next what's next Cymru what's next? You know, yeah. the alliance that's kind yeah. of with people from all all over Wales from the different bits of the sector all meeting together online to discuss the future and I've been you know really glad to be a part of all of that yes you're definitely definitely right it has raised a lot of awareness about the arts um another question from Thomas Derek he's asking are vaccine passports a viable way to return to live productions and events sooner uh Sean Guanhian would you push for these passports um, well, I've got so I'm in two minds. Um, I think really um, we will be able to open up be, before long um, unless there's another kind of variant. I mean, that's what threw things last time, wasn't it, Sarah? I mean, we were working yeah. towards the reopening and I think the guidance was there. It was nearly there. And then, of course, we had this other virus come through. Now we've got the vaccination. Um, it's a matter now of keeping those cases as low as possible. And, um, you know, 
a vaccine passport may be the way forward. I'm not sure, um, because I think that, you know, there are some human rights implications um, that we need to look at um, around that. I'd be interested to see what other people think, actually. Yeah, I think the passport idea is is complex, isn't it? It's not, mm. um, you know, uh, and having worked on many festivals, you know, people can produce fake ID at the drop of a hat, you know, to, you know, and that's just to get a drink over the bar. So goodness knows what, um, you know, complications a passport might have. And, and then we'll end up in a sort of tiered system where it's for those who have and those who have not. And yeah, I'm I'm not convinced it's the way forward. You know, unfortunately, people aren't as genuine perhaps as we'd all like to think we can all be. And I think it'll just create some massive divides, which perhaps are unnecessary in a time of recovery. Well, yeah. thank you very much there. Thank you, Kat, there in the newsroom. I'm afraid that the half hour has flown by and it's been a very healthy discussion. So I'd like to thank all of our panellists today for joining us. Thank you as well to you at home for uh, taking part and sending in and reacting to the discussion. Remember to follow all of our platforms uh, at Broadcast CGS on Twitter, Instagram and TikTok. But for now, diolch yn fawr iawn for watching a ffrinnau'n